SJC 12258, Commonwealth v. Mark R. Aldana. Good morning, Chief Justice and Justices. I'm Ethan Stiles, and I'm representing Mr. Aldana here today. And um, I, have two, I have two issues I'd like to bring before the court, and I'll start with first um, whether the statutory scheme applied to Mr. Aldana and his, um, and his substance, thermite, and then I'll go on to the uh, suppression issue. So um, we have a situation here where Mr. Aldana was convicted not of possession of an incendiary substance, but possession of ingredients uh, um, in which to make an incendiary um, device or substance or an explosive, namely thermite. And um, as we all here now know, how to that it's thermite is very easy, they're very easy to make, um, but uh, is not so easy to ignite. Um, and um, so the problem is, of course, is where does thermite fit under the statutory scheme? Now, the Commonwealth has in introduced um, regulations um, and statutes out to the trial level and, and, told the and um, presented to the judge that this is the scheme that it falls under. But I would suggest that, that it did not, um, and I have argued so. Um, namely that, first of all, the experts agreed that thermite was not an explosive and said, and said it burns, it doesn't, it doesn't explode. So we don't, so we don't really, look, so, and the, the, um, the section of the regulations that um, the Commonwealth uh, put before the trial judge and asked them to take judicial notice of, that's, 527 code mass regs 13 applies to explosives and specifically and explicitly does not apply to pyrotechnics. Now, I believe the parties seem to agree that, that thermite is a pyrotechnic and there is a, there is a scheme that, um, that, deals with fire, that deals with fireworks, the unlawful possession and the unlawful manufacture and sale of fireworks. But Mr. Aldado was not charged with those, uh, with those offenses and those offenses are just are misdemeanors. In fact, um, possession of fireworks is just only amounts to a fine of, of up to $100. So instead, we, um, you know, if there is anything to be had, we have to look at whether it qual whether thermite qualifies as a destructive or incendiary device or substance, and that's defined as um, an explosive article or device designed or adapted to cause physical harm to persons or property by means of fire, explosion, deflagration, or detonation. In uh, this, do, do we take into account as we're going over these regulations and definitions that um, a bag of ten uh, blasting caps? Was was found and plastic explosives were found. Uh, that's the Carter case, Justice Lowy. And um, the answer, and the answer, the answer to your question is: we have what the police found was arguably thermite in a bag. Um, they didn't find any pipes to make it into a bomb or anything like that, or anything like that that would suggest it would be turned into an explosive. So all we have is the substance itself. And I would suggest the cases of this court require more than just a substance that could be infl uh, inf ignited, because if that was the point, all sorts of common household chemicals and items would also be, um, be under the statute. Um, so you think this is a common household chemical? Um, Spread on the walls in the way that they discovered it? Uh, no, 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 ju no, Justice Link, it was not. But it is not purely a destructive um, chem uh, chemical. It does have legit legitimate constructive uses as well. I mentioned ther uh, thermal, wel thermal welding. Um, Especially in, especially in terms of railways, is, we usually, is the most common constructive use for it. So ultimately, we don't have a situation where he's just making um, nitroglycerin in his, um, in his apartment, where obviously that's a very different uh, type, of, type of chemical. But I think our cases have looked to, you know, when we're looking that, that it tries more than just making up the substance, but turning, but turning it into an article, a device, or um, um, an article, device, or an explosive. And um, the case, and I think there are three or four cases. But, talk but about. doesn't it mean? 102A1 refers to any substance which alone or in combination could be used to make an incendiary device. Uh, it could be used to make an incendiary device. It, um, it, it could be, but there was no evidence of, of that in this, in this case. I mean, because, and, and we must be careful because I'm we sorry, might get to this. You, you say that, I mean, if you were to combine the two, you would have something which would be uh, potentially could cause physical harm by fire, could it not? Um, yeah, yes, it could, but so could gasoline or kerosene or propane or cooking oil or alcohol. All those things can be set on fire and also cause harm. So essentially, we have to guard against the, the, uh, the approach where the substance proves the, convic the conviction. Essentially, if you have the substance, you've shown 
um, your, your, intent to your intent to make a destructive device. Is it the, de the device part that you contest? The fact that there was no pipe for pipe bomb, et cetera? Um, yes, because I believe the statute does require that as an, as an element that, it, that it's, that if you, if you, because it is defined um, in section 101, um, it explicitly defines it as an explosive article or device. And our cases have talked about things like, um, uh, there was uh, the Lombardo case that deals with um, gunpowder in a cigarette pack. And um, there was another case, the name escapes me, which dealt with uh, propane tanks wrapped in telephone books. I was cited in one of the briefs. And um, it was found not guilty of possession of the actual device. That's, that's correct, Justice Hines. So we don't need to go into that, right? Well, but the theory of the Commonwealth is he had the, he had the aluminum powder and the red iron oxide to make thermite. Well, then what do you do with, if I'm wrong about the record, let me know that both experts, the, the Commonwealth expert and the defendant's expert, say that the only reason that you'd have put these two chemicals together would be to create thermite. There'd be no reason to have these two chemicals together, these two items together, as opposed to other items that might individually um, uh, not be a danger. Well, that well that is that that is a supposition. I mean, we do have the we do have the chemicals separately bagged. However, there was no evidence to suggest that each chemical could not have its own use. For other purposes, I'm just going by the, what the expert said, uh, yeah. the, including your client's expert said there's just no reason to have the two of them yeah. together, uh, other than to create thermite. Yes, and I would suggest that that ultimately doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter because even if he has the intent to create thermite, that's not enough for a conviction. He has to have the intent to create to do more than just create thermite. He has to have the intent to make, uh, to use these things to make a harmful or an incendiary. A harmful, you know, an incendiary or destructive or an explosive. And the case that you mentioned earlier, Justice Lowry, um, the Carter case involving the C4 and the, um, and the blasting caps, I, I, think, I think you did. Um, anyway, in that case, you know, all it took was simply to combine those two things and then you have your explosive. But, but each individually does not function as an explosive. Um, so, if he, so if the police only found blasting caps or if they only found C4, they might have had a harder case. But whereas in this case, we just have thermite in a bag. Uh, we don't have it in any type of special container which might suggest it's going to be used as an explosive or any special way to... Mike's point about where the police uh, uh, observed it. Is there an inference from it being on the windowsill and where else it's being? Uh, is there an inference that uh, he has an untoward purpose because uh, he's trying to discard it? Um, that it... I would, perhaps that may be an inference that it could have been made under the facts under the facts of this case, but I don't necessarily. But um, ultimately, you know, it doesn't really matter what what uh, you know what his intent what his intent was. The Commonwealth's um, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean it does. Um, but the Commonwealth's theory was that thermite. We prove that he had thermite. That's our case. That's all. We don't have to prove that he made a thermite bomb or was going to make a, a a device that would project the thermite. Um, all we need to do is show is show thermite, and we're done. And we're done. Um, and ultimately, I would suggest that that approach um, doesn't come rise to the level of the statute requires, which requires a device or sub, a device, or article or explosive. But all you need to show is an intent to create such a device. But, um, but there, but there was no other evidence that would suggest that he ha that he had any intent. They didn't couldn't even find. They 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 didn't do a full search of the of the apartment. Um, and they didn't find any device, anything like a sparkler or a flare or a magnesium strip, which could even ignite the thermite. But more, but more importantly, you have the provision which says you don't need to have all the pieces of the device to, to find somebody guilty of having parts of a device. I mean, if you have an explosive, you don't necessarily need to have the detonator in order to be guilty of this crime. Y yes, but I, th but I think what we only have here, we don't even have the device. There is, there is no evidence to support a device here. The, all we have is evidence of substance. And I would point out that the Commonwealth on appeal brought the court's attention to 527 Code Mass Regulations, for section 14. And that section, which appears to apply to, um, to, to um, flammable substances generally, and I think if you're going to look at that, flammable, it talks about flammable solids. I think that's probably the closest thing we have here to uh, what thermite would qualify for, although, it's, although um, we don't have any expert testimony. But, if, but even so, the, 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 in, the, uh, the statute does say, you know, whoever without lawful authority, you know, the lawful authority element is also part of the statute. And we have in section 14 an exception that says an individual may, store, 
may store up to 100 pounds of a flammable soil without a permit. Um, and I've pointed that out, and I've pointed that out. So ultimately, I, th I believe that, um, that, the subs that the bare substance alone, without evidence of more, is not, um, is not sufficient. And, and I'll talk about one more, the, the Bushway case and then move on. In Bushway, you had a situation where a defendant um, had, plastic, had gasoline in plastic bags, and he was, pick, pick, he was pulled over, picked up by the cops, and, and the judge said, you know, there are legitimate uses and there are illegitimate uses of, of this sort of thing. And uh, the jury found that he had an illegitimate use because he had a, he also had a container of gasoline and was also telling the, the police officer, you know, some rather insolent, um, uh, flippant um, things about what he was intending to do with that. And we don't have any of that here. So I suggest that, you know, that, e that you know, when it comes to this, the, this statute, you know, it requires more than just the substance, it requires the an advice or an intent to make the device, and the coma only proceeded on the substance itself. So I'd like to turn to the suppression for the remainder of my argument here. Um, so I have raised two suppression issues. Number one was the failure to announce the pres uh, failure to announce the purpose of the police's visit. The police, you know, banged on the door and said, "Police, Worcester Police," but they didn't tell. They didn't say, "We're here to we're here to arrest Mark Aldana." Uh, we have a default. We have a search. We have an arrest warrant or anything like that. Is, is it my memory that, that that's when they heard the, the, the window break? One of the officers did hear glass breaking. But that'd be kind of a reason to get into the building, wouldn't it? Um, I'm not sure. In the sequence of events, I'm not sure if they heard the glass breaking as they as they're already breaking down the door before or before then. I think, but I. The the record says that well, that they heard it before they asked three times they said three times Worcester police they heard glass breaking they heard somebody moving around and mm -hmm. that's when they broke the door okay. down okay so if you so i mean glass breaking you know doesn't it's kind of corroborated by the rope ladder right and the broken window yeah. I, I i can see that <laughs> um, so we're not really talking about a far fetched thing right no but ultimately you know i think you know the police still isn't isn't absolved from the requirement. Worcester police, Worcester police, arrest warrant, open the door, um, and then if they hear the blast breaking, you know, go on, by all means, go on, go on in. But in this case, there, you know, there was no reason for them not to have announced the purpose of their of their entry. I mean, because let's assume, let's assume you're right about that. Let's assume they should have said, Worcester police, we have an arrest warrant, mm -hmm. and they didn't. Uh, what's the consequence if indeed the judge is correct based on the record that? they heard the glass breaking before they entered. Would that not generate an independent exigency to justify their forced entry? Well, um, I, you know, glass breaking could mean, you know, doesn't, I mean, there is the inference that he might be trying to escape. Um, but, you know, I don't, and I, with all due respect to Justice Gaziato, I don't think we look to the, you know, after what the police officers saw when they got in to I'm, say, I'm, okay, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you do, but um, here, um, you, you probably should move to the probable cause part of it, or the uh, plain view part of it. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So we get. All right. So we get into the. So they, the guy, the police officers get in. They see him. They arrest him. They take him out and they leave. And they also see the chemicals in the kitchen. Um, now, I believe that um, that the that the white case controls here, um, and that was uh, that was your 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 opinion, just Chief Justice Gans. Um, and in white, you uh, the court held that. Um, or, or, or seem to disapprove of police officers, you know, uh, research, you know, in conducting internet research to find out what the what the suspicious thing might be. Now, in this case, White, though, was as I recall, was an inventory search. Yes. And so the argument was an inventory search cannot be investigative, mm -hmm. uh, but is it? What is wrong with a police officer who has fear that he may have a dangerous substance in front of him using his phone and Googling the two terms right then and there and determining that they are indeed dangerous. Well there there are two there are two there are two problems with that. I mean I mean what I mean so first I mean so first of all we have a situation where um, they um, you know it's not immediately apparent to them what these chemicals are and what they or what they do or what they what, what they're being used for. And so in other cases um, you do have that situation where police officers are trained to, you know, you know, they know what guns look like, they know what drugs look like, they know what drug paraphernalia looks like. So we don't have that here. But I think the, the more important and the other issue, of course, is all right. They see they they see it. They um, 
and obviously they've seen it, so they can look at it anytime. But at that point, do they say, okay, let's go get a search warrant. We think we, think we have probable cause to suggest this guy has, has made this thermite stuff. And so they just go, let's go seize and test and uh, destroy it um, in, our, in the DPW uh, yard. So I mean, so ultimately there was no reason why they could not have said, okay, it looks like, you know, we think we, think we have probable cause here. Let's close up the apartment, put a, uh, put a police officer on there, go to a magistrate, get a warrant, come back and test. Wouldn't that be a better argument if the bags weren't open and you didn't have some of them on the windowsill and, and, and not knowing what the danger is of these substances? Well, see, I, in another, in an, if it were another type of substance, I, I might agree with you. But in this case, we know, we know that thermite is a, is a stable substance and it doesn't burn, and it doesn't burn absent a very high temperature. So the likelihood that it would that spon spontaneously combust is non-existent. I know, but we're talking about immediately apparent right now. We're, we're not, we're talking about the um, issue of plain view and whether uh, the incriminating character was immediately apparent. That's where you were. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, and then I uh, switched from immediately apparent to uh, what the police could have done. So ultimately, I don't, you know, I don't think, you know, ultimately they, the police, the police don't know it's thermite until they go out and burn, and burn it, and then they can come to a conclusion it burns like thermite, the, uh, the, uh, the expert looks at it and says it looks like thermite, therefore it is thermite. Um, but, uh, but, and, but at that point, we have a reasonable suspicion. If they have a probable cause to suspect it's thermite, and, they, and they've educated themselves to know what thermite is, then I would suggest that, um, that, they, could, that, they, should go, that they should go to a magistrate and, and do it, because it's really not, you know, I would say, beyond, you know, um, it, um, it's only still a, it only is still a suspicion of what it might be, because they haven't had opportunity to rule out all the other, other things it could be. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Simmons, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, Joseph Simmons for the Commonwealth. The, uh, there's a lot of discussion about the thermite itself and uh, the two main parts is that it's without lawful authority. Thermite is an incendiary that uh, burns up to 4,000 degrees, that's much higher than most items you would normally come into contact with. And it's so good at what it does, which is to destroy and set things on fire, that it's used by the Army um, in thermite grenades, which are incendiaries, which uh, U.S. First Campo identify the court, would identify that it's up to a fact for the jury for whether an incendiary grenade uh, that contained thermite uh, would be, whether a grenade containing thermite would be an incendiary grenade. Um, in the uh, current case, the experts, uh, Trooper Gehagen, testified that thermite itself in a residential building, based on the degrees of 4,000 degrees, anything it came in contact with for reg regular building materials, wood, um, upholstery, steel, it would burn through and keep on going. So in a residential apartment building, such as the defendants in his apartment, once ignited, the thermite would burn uh, through his floor into the apartment below and continue. Did they know that before they seized the substance? The, the officers that originally seized it entered the apartment. Um, you have the photographs that the, from the scene where the officers observed with the thermite um, scattered on the counter, uh, on the windowsill, on the outside of the windowsill going down with a broken glass below. They saw that, they saw the two bags of the chemical powders, the aluminum powder and the iron oxide. Uh, Sergeant Richardson, who was the uh, lead supervisor on the scene, has 29 years of experience, had never encountered something like this before. Uh, but based on the appearance of it, it made him suspicious. So, so my question is, did they, did they figure out what this was before they seized it? Or did they research it they, after the fact? They observed it. As, as uh, Sergeant Richardson was looking at it, the Holden detectives came up. One of them had his phone where he was able to Google uh, iron oxide and aluminum powder, and it came back as thermite. That's the basic uh, definition for the dictionary for thermite, iron oxide and aluminum powder. Based on that, they contacted agents from the, uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, and the State Fire, uh, State Fire Marshal's Explosives uh, technicians came out to the scene. At that point, they just waited for them to come. Once they observed it, they made the determination that it was uh, a hazardous material and then removed it from the scene. Why didn't they get a warrant? 
Well, they had the, the arrest warrant, Your Honor, but also it... A warrant to seize the substance. To see, it's a exigent circumstances. It's a dangerous chemical in an apartment building at that time, um, and it's in plain view. They could take it. It's obviously apparent from that, from that item, Your Honor. So what do we, let's discuss this immediate apparent provision, because it's not ours, no. it's under federal law, uh, and we can't expand its definition beyond what the federal law provides for. Does it permit some degree of investigation at the scene to determine whether or not the substance is dangerous? Uh, yes, Your Honor, a, a Franco, I believe is the case uh, from the Commonwealth, they would allow police executing an arrest warrant they were entitled to remain on in um, an apartment and call experts to investigate uh, chemical compositions of a powder that was in their presence. And then once the experts came to the scene and determined that it was something that was dangerous, then they could remove it from the scene. Right, but the, the issue is the Google search. I mean, yes. if it were, if they had basically gone and found some prescription bottles or is it your position that they could have then Googled, gone to the pills, opened it up, Googled it, and seen whether it was a controlled substance or not? I know there's, um, for pills specifically, on it, it's a different situation than this, the fact pattern here, Your Honor. This is, the chemicals are sprayed out. Um, the officers who went in there were familiar with narcotics. This was obviously not narcotics. You can see the view of where the materials were smeared on the walls, there's some on the phone department. It's not um, the same as a pharmaceutical search. It's basically, it's chemical powders, which are not something you would encounter in a kitchen or even for use storing narcotics. And is the difference, though, the potential risk of danger? Does that, is that why you, can, you couldn't Google the pill bottle, but you can Google this? I, I think, Someone could Google if they wanted to, if they have, it's, it's a new tool as we've moved um, further into technology. But then what you would do with the items for a pharmaceuticals, that's not, that's something you would probably need to go get a warrant at that point. But this, based on the fact it's a um, thermite, based on the, the experts that came to the scene and actually confirmed um, and then took from the scene, uh, you had two, the, the ATF bomb tech, Agent Murray, and you had Trooper Hagen from the state police both observed the materials, looked at the iron oxide and aluminum powder, and based on their training experience, determined that it was, in fact, thermite. That was all after the Google search. I mean, it seems as if the issue was whether, certainly once you have the Google search, then you know it's thermite. Well, well again, the, the, the trooper and the police officers at the scene didn't know what this was. They just knew that, to them, it seemed um, it was concerning to them. A troop, um, Sergeant Richardson believed later that it could make a bomb, but based on what he was appearing and the view of going into this room where you have a defendant who's barricaded into his apartment, you get into the room, you, they hear glass breaking as they're going into the apartment and things moving around. They find the defendant over by the window with the window broken out, where it's broken from the inside going out based on the appearance you have this chemical smeared on the walls, you have it on the counter uh, with the bag ripped open, you have it on the edge of the window still going out the window. To them, it appeared that, this, that the defendant was trying to dispose of this item, so it was some form of contraband, but it was something they had not encountered before from the chemicals, iron oxide, aluminum powder, not something that a normal... They know from labels that that's what it was? Yes, on the, on the actual labels, Your Honor, uh, one bag is... It's a five pound bag of uh, iron oxide. The second bag is of aluminum powder. Uh, on the aluminum powder bag, you actually see some of the red iron oxide, which is a red rust, is one of the materials, is actually smeared on that bag as well. Are you saying, uh, I know you don't need to rely on this in your view because of the Google search, but are you saying that in the circumstances here, the um, incriminating character was immediately apparent without the Google um, search? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Could we, uh, could, could you, we didn't talk about it with the, the defendant, but um, the uh, unit of prosecution issue. Um, here, 
It was two substances, two yes. charges. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, could have been a different kind of thing, and it could have been five or six um, and charged separately. And it, here the judge sentenced concurrently, but there was no need to do that. So you could wind up easily with a situation where the ingredients alone charged separately carry a heavier sentence than the device itself. It depends on what your components might be, Your Honor. Um, for substance in this case, you had the one bag of the iron oxide and the one bag of the aluminum powder were present there. Um, there was not, so it's not, if there was a situation where you had five bags of aluminum powder but you had the intent to make the thermite, it would still be on that case, that would be one prosecution just for the, that one component, which would be the aluminum powder, even though there's Say five. Say that again, I'm sorry. I'm if sorry. you had, for the aluminum powder, if you had five bags of aluminum powder in the apartment and you could show the intent to make right, okay, the thermite. Right, okay, so you had five, multiple bags of the same substance. Then it, that would just be one. one yes, because it's one, so, I, I know, but here you have whatever the incendiary device is in order to make it, you have to have multiple components. And that's the question. If you have something, an incendiary device that has multi multiple components, can you charge separately for each of those components without it being duplicative in some sense? For each individual component, you could. You could have a situation where you have someone, um, for example, if you had a, a Molotov cocktail or, or that's an incendiary device, you could have five cans of gasoline, um, five bottles of bottles or five rags, that could also be components, but more specifically for a bigger device of, let's say, someone who was using a pressure cooker, which is a normal lawful item that people normally possess, but if you could show the intent to use that pressure cooker to uh, make an incendiary device and they had ball bearings on the side, like they could have 60,000 ball bearings and the... Um, the two, one pressure cooker, they should be separate based on the intent, the way the statute is, is written. Let me ask you this. Let's, just, let's assume you found a uh, pressure cooker de device and you charged the person only with the pressure cooker device. Okay, so you had one charge under 101, I think, or 10, 102A or whatever. You would charge the device. Uh, and during the course of trial, it May it turns out that there's at least evidence that perhaps that device was missing a necessary element to form the device. Uh, can you then go to the judge and say, Your Honor, I'd like to offer 102A as a lesser included offense? I believe 102A would be a lesser included offense of 102C. So if it's a lesser included offense, then all of the parts that would form that device would be one count? I, I think if specifically in this case you had the substance, which is the thermite, um, the, the trial judge did not direct out the, the 102C charge. He went that as a fact finder, made the decision on that count. But for the 102C, you have, um, you had both the defense expert and the Commonwealth's expert agreed that it was in fact a thermite mixture. That would be, could be considered an incendiary substance to complete, and then you could have separate components that weren't used for that specific incendiary substance that could be the component pieces okay, as well. I guess my question is, you're saying that if there were, if you had, thir if you have a case in which, and use my pressure cooker, there are, thir there are 14 pieces necessary to, to create the pressure cooker bomb, uh, you think that all 14 are there, uh, but you charge it as a single device. You could arguably say, if you knew there were 13, you could say, I got 13 counts. Uh, each of these pieces are 13 counts because there are 13 separate components of it. But my concern <coughs> is if you had charged it as the device itself and it had turned out that you fell short of showing it was a complete bomb, you'd have only one count as a lesser included. Isn't there some inconsistency I I, th I think in the, the fact you're, Pat, you're saying that the person that attempted to start assembling the items in that case, these specifically are the bags in the, in the chemical. So if they have them separate, separate, separated out, if for his assembly kit with his uh, one pressure cooker, he had the ball bearings in there, he had a um, explosive, 
in there, we're starting to work towards, start getting towards a, a type of primer or a fuse. But he didn't say so he didn't have the fuse, so that was almost completely assembled. And then over here, you have six pressure, another six pressure cookers, um, 3,000 ball bearings, whatever. That one unit would go to the device, and if it was that was a lesser included offense, it'd be based on that pressure cooker. The other items would be separate components that could be used for other incendiary devices, but you wouldn't technically usually have three pressure cookers built into one one uh, device. May I ask, uh, how do you interpret uh, 102A1? Is it the substance that you're using to make the device that, that the law prohibits, or is it the device itself? I mean, it seems to me that C um, punishes the possession of the finished product, right? The um, C C so C C when it's all put together right but in this but this this statute is intended to punish the components right yes if you're trying to assemble it if you have the intent right, to assemble right. it I, I get that so what I'm trying to figure out is whether the substances themselves is is that what the statute is referring to as possessing without lawful authority because it wouldn't make any sense uh, to say that the device is the is the, the device is what's covered by the unlawful it, authority because that's punished in C. So are we talking about in, in the example that you were dis, you were just discussing? You couldn't prosecute somebody for having ball bearings and uh, a pressure cooker because those things are not. Uh, you can lawfully possess those. It, it would be what your intent was to do with those items, Your Honor. That's the difference, which would be fact-based in every different case. What was the intent of the person to perform it? In this case, because he actually did make, the, the experts agree, the thermite compound, his intent to possess the iron oxide and the aluminum powder was to perform thermite um, in this case, Your Honor. I'm just trying to figure out what without lawful authority means. Whoever... <laughs> without lawful authority has in his possession or under his control these things. It, for, so without lawful authority, it is possible, uh, just the M MBTA or other commercial agencies, to possess thermite. You would have to go to the fire department to, depending on the, the amount, either get a license or a permit to possess it. So, so is this like the bur burglarious tool, tool statute where, okay, it's okay to have these things, but you can't have them if your intent is to break in a building. Is this yes? And you have to have some evidence, fact-based, to show what it is. So, if there was, um, if all the defendant had was rust in his house, you wouldn't have, and nothing more than that, and show up. It's okay. We're going to say he's going to use this to make thermite. Th that's you wouldn't just have what I'm to intent. Get okay. What about you have a waffle to... iron? Say again, Your Honor. You have a waffle iron. Period. But yeah, I know I'm going to intend to use this in a way to create an incendiary device. I, I'm not sure how the uh, waffle iron <laughs> would be used for that, Your Honor, but... Um, I'm trying to say that, you know, you take an otherwise innocent device like a pressure cooker. It, Many cooks have them. Yes, and it just like just like the pressure cookers. Every, pe most people have them in their homes, but it's the intent on what you're looking to do with it um, and the other facts involved in the case that would get you to that intent. Uh, if there's no further questions, I would... Uh, rest on my brief and ask that you affirm the defense convictions. Okay, thank you.